Welcome back to Bargaining 101, I'm William Spaniel, and this lecture is on other solutions to the ultimatum game. Just to be really clear up front here, this lecture is technical. We're going to be talking about some of the game theoretical underpinnings going on in the ultimatum game and in bargaining in general. If you are uninterested in the formalities, go ahead and skip this one. It's fine. You won't be missing out on anything too important. This is just here for people who are going through these lectures, perhaps because they're taking a class on game theory or taking a class on bargaining and maybe even have a problem set or homework that they're looking at that needs to answer this sort of question. So again, if you are uninterested in the game theoretical backgrounds and un underpinnings of bargaining, go ahead and skip this one. There's no shame in doing that. But if you're still here, this is something that I cover in the appendix of chapter two of Game Theory 101 Bargaining. Now remember back to last time, we had broken down Barbara's decision as follows. We know that if Albert offers her greater than $4,500, then Barbara has to accept. That's because she values the car at $4,500. So if Albert is offering her more than that, of course Barbara is going to accept. On the other end of the spectrum, if X is less than $4,500, then Barbara has to reject. That should be clear. And that's because Barbara values, again, the car at $4,500. So if Albert is offering her less than how much she values it at, of course she's going to reject. That leaves this middle case at exactly equal to $4,500 as unclear. In the previous lecture, we supposed that in this case where Barbara is indifferent between accepting and rejecting, she accepts. But again, indifference is indifference. She could very well do anything when X is exactly equal to $4,500. And so now we're going to investigate this here. So let's look at what happens when X is equal to $4,500 and Barbara accepts. So if Albert offers Barbara her value for the vehicle, exactly $4,500, Barbara accepts under those circumstances. Well, based off of the logic that we worked on last lecture, it should be very clear that Albert is going to optimally offer $4,500 in this case. The reason is as follows. If Albert offers any value greater than $4,500, say, 4503, Barbara is still going to accept. However, Albert is going to be paying a higher price for the vehicle, and he knows that alternatively, he could just be offering $4,500, still getting Barbara to accept the purchase price, and he'll get more value out of the deal for himself because he's still getting that $5,000 car, that's how much he values the car at, at a lower price, at only $4,500 instead of a higher price like 4503 or 4502 or even 4501. And of course, offering anything less than $4,500 is silly for Albert because he could buy the vehicle very easily at $4,500 and get $500 in profit for himself, whereas if he offers anything less, he gets rejected and he gets no profit whatsoever. So it should be clear here, this one is pretty obvious, that if X is exactly equal to $4,500 and Barbara accepts under those circumstances, then Albert is in fact going to be offering exactly $4,500 as his optimal proposal. Okay, that does not actually take care of everything, unfortunately. When X is exactly to equal to $4,500, again, Barbara is indifferent, and indifference means that she's willing to do absolutely anything. So it might not be the case that she's accepting under those circumstances, and it might not be the case that she's rejecting under those circumstances. It might be the case that she's randomizing between accepting and rejecting. So suppose, lastly, this is the last case we're considering, when X is exactly equal to $4,500, Barbara accepts with probability P and rejects with probability 1 minus P. Now things grow very complicated very quickly, and this is going to show us eventually why we don't tend to use these discrete versions of ultimatum games when we are studying bargaining. So under those circumstances, under the circumstances where Barbara is accepting with probability P when X is equal to $4,500, Albert is willing to offer $4,500 under the following circumstances. We're looking at the utility for offering $4,500 on the left and the utility for offering $4,501 on the right. So what is Albert's payoff or utility, that's that U function there, for offering $4,500? Well, with probability P under these circumstances, Barbara is accepting, which means the purchase goes through and Albert reaps $500 in profit. 
With remaining probability, Barbara is rejecting. With probability 1 minus P, Barbara is rejecting. And Albert ends up with no deal whatsoever, so he receives no profit. So we have a zero there. And we're comparing that to what happens when Albert offers exactly 4501 and Barbara accepts, which for sure, this will be guaranteed, nets Albert $499 in profit. That's because he values the car at $5,000 and he's paying a purchase price of $4,501. Why are we comparing these two values, these two offer values, 4500 and 4501? Well, it should be clear that offering anything greater than 4501 is never going to be optimal, say offering 4502, because under these circumstances, Albert can always offer 4501 and guarantee a sale of the vehicle. So if he wants to guarantee a sale of the vehicle, his optimal purchase price is 4501. It's not going to be anything higher. And similarly, if we are looking at any price below $4,500, those prices aren't going to be optimal because, again, Albert can guarantee a sale at $4,501 and reap $499 in profit, whereas if he offers anything less than $4,500, he receives no profit whatsoever. So that means our ultimate calculation boils down to figuring out whether Albert wants to get the safety of the guaranteed acceptance from Barbara if he offers $4,501, or if he's willing to risk that gamble between Barbara accepting sometimes and rejecting sometimes when he offers $4,500. And so the second bullet point actually maps out how much those payoffs are. And if we solve for P, we're just doing a little bit of algebra here, we see that if P is greater than 499 over 500, Albert will offer $4,500. Essentially, to interpret what that means, if Barbara is extremely likely to accept an offer equal to $4,500, then Albert is willing to forego the profit from the vehicle. He's willing to risk having Barbara reject because there's only a dollar to be gained here and he's only getting rejected very, very infrequently. So put a different way, if Barbara was to accept with a higher degree of probability, it would not be in Albert's best interest to risk having this deal fall through just to gain an extra dollar through bargaining. And in fact, that's what we're going to see in this next slide. So this is what happens when we have circumstances where Albert is going to offer $4,500. We could look to see when Albert is going to offer $4,501 by simply flipping all of these inequalities. So now we're looking at when Albert's utility for offering $4,501 is greater than $4,500. And the math is identical here. We just flip the inequality. And so at the end of this, if we look at the last bullet point, we see that if P is less than 499 over 500, this is the circumstance where Albert is going Going to play it safe and offer 4501. That's because Barbara is rejecting with a fair degree of probability if Albert is offering $4,500, if he's trying to be super aggressive with it. And so Albert is going to play it safe, again, because it's not worth risking that extra dollar or not worth risking having the deal fall through just to obtain an extra dollar through bargaining. And unfortunately, we're not quite done here yet. We've looked at circumstances where Albert's payoff is greater for offering one than the other, but there is a circumstance, a very specific circumstance, where Albert is now indifferent between offering $4,500 and $4,501. So now we've just changed all of those inequalities to equalities, and we see at the end, at that last bullet point, when P is exactly equal to 499 over 500, Albert is indifferent between offering $4,500 and offering $4,501. So he, in fact, could randomize between those two things as well. Now, if you've taken a class on game theory, we would call such a set of optimal strategies a subgame perfect equilibrium. And as it turns out, the set of subgame perfect equilibria for a discrete ultimatum game is very large for the reasons that we've discussed in this lecture. We had one solution from the previous lecture and a bunch of different variants in solutions in this lecture, all depending upon what Barbara did when she was indifferent between accepting and rejecting. And in fact, I'm just going to leave this one here. Oh, yeah. Uh, notice that we have a, a spelling error top, at the top here with equilibria. That's because I guess uh, Microsoft doesn't understand that the plural of equilibrium is equilibria and not equilibriums. That's a pet peeve. Never say equilibriums, always say equilibria. I'm actually glad I didn't fix that 
uh, spell check there just so I could say that. In any case, if we look through this slide here, uh, this is summarizing everything that we talked about in the last two lectures. We talked about the situation where Barbara is accepting if and only if X is greater than $4,500, and that's causing Albert to offer $4,501. We started off in this lecture looking at what happens when Barbara was accepting when X was greater than or equal to $4,500, or in other words, greater than 4499 We saw that in that case, Albert is offering exactly $4,500. And then most recently, when we went through all those additional calculations, uh, when Barbara was accepting with probability P and rejecting with probability 1 minus P when she was indifferent, we get a whole bunch of other different circumstances there. Okay, so what's the point of all of this? The point of all of this is that we hate the discrete ultimatum game as modelers precisely because it creates this strategic mess that we see here. Another half of this is that we also hate the ultimatum game, the discrete version of the ultimatum game, because it's not as realistic in a wide variety of important bargaining situations than a continuous offer space will be. And so I'm going to talk a little bit more about why we prefer continuous offer spaces and why there are a whole bunch of benefits to using continuous offer spaces when we get to the next lecture. So I hope you enjoyed this, and I hope to see you next time when we look at the continuous version of the ultimatum game. Take care.